Hello everyone, and welcome to the module on synthesis basics. So the basic idea of synthesis is that we're going to generate sound signals directly from mathematical, mechanical, or electrical components um, instead of, for example, recording of those sound signals with a microphone. The word synthesis in a very general sense means to put together and when we're doing sound synthesis as we'll see this involves putting together or connecting some number of small devices that produce or transform audio signals. When people talk about synthesis they may be talking about the long history of what is sometimes called analog synthesis. And so on this slide, I want to talk a little bit about some of those different types of analog synthesis. Up here on the top left, we have a picture of a modular synthesizer. And it's called a modular synthesizer because if we look closely, we can see that each of these uh, parts of this synthesizer are actually separate little blocks that are screwed into our, our rack. We can kind of see the uh, spaces in between the different units here. And each one of these units does a different thing. It has some controls on it, and it has some uh, jacks and connectors where we can get audio signals or input audio signals into other modules by connecting them with these colorful patch cables. And this is a way of doing synthesis that has been around for, for many decades, and it's experiencing something of a resurgence in our time. People are making new modules for modular synthesis and selling them and people are getting um, quite into and quite good at making interesting sounds, <clears throat> making their own unique combinations of these modules that produce interesting sounds. Probably when we think of the word synthesizer though, we're likely to think of something like this. Uh, this is a, a mini Moog synthesizer and in some sense what this represents is a standardization of this modular synthesis idea over here. There's a standard set of modules that have been put together across the top. They're already connected to each other in certain ways without patch cables and a keyboard has been added to, um, to make it possible to, to play melodies and that kind of thing with the synthesizer. So this was a uh, an innovation change that happened in the history of synthesizers around the 1970s and it was so successful that um, for many people the word synthesizer has come to mean something uh, like this this keyboard interface. Um, at around the same time perhaps a little bit later we started seeing programmable drum machines like this Roland 808 uh, down here in the bottom left corner and I think this is another example of analog synthesis with the Roland 808, what it has inside it are uh, 12 synthesizer circuits where electronic components are connected in such a way that they can make audio signals that are meant to emulate the sound of a bass drum or a kick drum or, you know, or, or a snare. Uh, and then the TR-808, uh, just like this synthesizer had a keyboard added to it, this one has something added to it as well. This one has a, a sequencer interface next to it, a drum programming interface. Uh, so that people could set up uh, particular patterns of beats with the underlying synthesizers of the 808. Another form that analog synthesis takes, and I think uh, here I'm uh, straying off the beaten path into something that very few people would call synthesis, although I think it's c connected conceptually, is the practice that guitarists have, electric guitarists, of putting their signal from their guitar through long chains of pedals. So I'm not, I'm not sure where this chain of pedals begins. I think it's probably on the, on the left here. Not 100% sure. But somewhere um, the, the guitarist is playing their guitar and there's a cable coming from the guitar into one of these pedals. And then there's a cable going from that pedal into the next one and from that one into the next one and from that one into the next one and so on and so forth. And at the end of this long chain of pedals, there's a cable that takes that very much altered sound signal and uh, sends it to an amplifier or a recording interface or something like that. So, you know, in the case of the guitarist with their guitar pedal board, the sound is still starting 
with uh, a quote unquote real acoustic instrument uh, and the little electric pickup on the electric guitar. But then it's going through this long chain of transformations. And I think that that really makes this another form of analog synthesis. Indeed, in some cases, we could use these guitar pedals together with these other devices um, to make um, hybrid synthesizers of different kinds. However, if analog synthesis is cool, nonetheless, it's much more likely that what we're going to do is what's called software synthesis. And that's when we um, put together sounds from smaller mathematical, mechanical, electrical components that are running in software, are simulated in software, um, uh, instead of being um, large, bulky, electrical apparatuses like the things we saw on the previous slide. And so this has lots of advantages. Advantage number one is relative to analog synthesis is that it's portable. Another advantage is that it's often much lower cost. And a third advantage, and I think this will become more obvious as we start to explore synthesis in our tutorials, uh, is that software synthesis is scalable. If we go back to the world of analog synthesis for a second, if we want another module in our modular synthesis rack, we have to shell out more money to buy that additional module that then takes up more space, that then is one more thing to carry to wherever we're going to use it. But in the world of software, scalability is usually just a matter of clicking somewhere or adding an extra uh, number to a piece of code or something like that. We can have many, many, many units many, many, many synthesis components um, without necessarily paying extra costs. So we're much more likely to explore synthesis ideas um, that scale uh, across many, many instances of things. Software synthesis has become very common in our time, and some kinds of it are built into computer operating systems and digital audio workstations. So your, your Macintosh or your Windows computers have some synthesizers built into them that occasionally are used by, uh, by games or other software. And the Reaper digital audio workstation that we're using in this class has some built-in synthesizers that we can use as well. These are examples of software synthesis. One of the things we're gonna explore in this course is that programming environments are particularly useful for software synthesis. And that the reason that I think they're particularly useful is because they often have more scalability than other approaches. Um, what we'll tend to see in software environments is that if we want 10 of something, yeah, sorry, in programming environments, is that if we want 10 of something or 20 or something or 50 of something, there's usually not a lot of obstacles uh, in our way um, to, to having that kind of scalability. Let's briefly think about some of the applications of synthesis. Um, as we've seen on earlier slides, like the TR-808 um, or the Mini Moog, one of the things that synthesizers have been used for is simulating, in, simulating other instruments, simulating drums, simulating keyboard instruments. Um, they might also be used to create sounds that address the ear in ways traditional physical instruments cannot. Uh, and I think that in both of those examples of the Mini Moog and the 808 drum machine, we see that happening. Some of the sounds that those instruments make resemble the sounds of traditional instruments, but other sounds don't. Um, or they have a certain relationship to traditional sounds, but they have other features that are due to their electronic nature. Um, the 808 in particular has become kind of like an iconic drum machine sound used in hip hop and techno and house and other genres. And I mean, that has to do with all of the different sounds in that machine. But to give an example of what, what I mean by creating sounds that address the ear in ways traditional physical instruments cannot, one of the things that producers found early on is that they could transform and layer the sounds of the 808's bass drum in interesting ways to make a bass drum that was particularly resonant or particularly deep or particularly thick uh, in its sound. Um, so a third possibility, a third possible application of synthesis is to making new instruments. And um, so not just making new sounds, but making new instruments around those sounds. There's a field of research called NIME, or New Interfaces for Musical Expression, N-I-M-E, 
uh, that focuses exactly on this possibility. If you're going to participate in that type of research and that type of innovation, synthesis is going to be your everyday bread and butter. Synthesis is particularly useful when we're making sounds for dynamic and interactive contexts. When we start to explore synthesis in other videos and, and in tutorials, one of the things we'll see is that when we work with synthesizers, they have a large and growing number of parameters that control them. And if you're in a dynamic or interactive context like a, a video game or an installation with a bunch of sensors, in those cases what you have is a bunch of inputs that can control things. So synthesis can be something that kind of completes the equation there. The, the installation or the video game has lots of inputs to things that can control things, and sound synthesis has lots of things that can be controlled uh, in order to produce interesting results. We might need to think about synthesis if what we're thinking about is making new and varied software for working with sound. The standard digital audio workstation that we work with, like Reaper, is itself built from synthesis components. So if we want to make our own digital audio workstation or we want to think about how the digital audio workstation could be different, synthesis is going to be one of the main things that we're going to be thinking about. And I would say that studying synthesis also gives us a different appreciation and understanding of how that standard software that we work with works. Uh, finally for this slide, um, new fields like machine listening and music information retrieval depend on synthesis in key ways. Machine listening is a field in which people write algorithms that are able to recognize things in audio signals automatically. And music information retrieval is a, a more specific subset of that. It's where they do machine listening specifically in order to recognize or categorize things about music. Um, in our time, this is used on an everyday basis, for example, by big platforms to understand when or to recognize when uh, a signal contains information that is the same as another signal and maybe is an example of a copyright infringement. There are many other ways these things are being used in our time. Um, so in sum, for this slide, synthesis has lots of applications. Uh, it's, it's a really um, basic, underlying, universal part of studying audio. Uh, and it's also a lot of fun. So that's why we're spending some time on it this week. So before we finish this video, I want to introduce one more basic synthesis concept, and that's the idea of the unit generator. We're going to unpack this more in the tutorial and in another video. So a unit generator is something that you can connect with other unit generators to produce or transform an audio signal. If we go back all the way to our analog synthesis page. Here on our modular synthesizer, we have um, uh, probably each one of these modules is a unit generator. Maybe a couple of them have several unit generators that work in a certain way together to transform or produce sound. Over here on the guitar pedal board, I think it's even more straightforward. We can, we can pretty much say that every each one of these guitar pedals is like a unit generator. The word unit generator, though, tends to be used in relation to software because this vocabulary of the unit generator comes from Max Matthews, who's pictured here on the right, uh, the computer music pioneer who created a series of computer music languages, sometimes called the Music N languages, because the first one was called Music 1, and then there was Music 2, Music 3, so on and so forth. And in those languages, he used the language, the, the vocabulary unit generator to describe each of these synthesis components that you could put into your project uh, and then have interact with other unit generators. So we're going to use that terminology in this course as well. The unit generator is kind of like a function in math, but it's specialized to audio. Unit generators are things that take some number of signals as input and they give some number of signals as output back. And we're going to look at some specific examples of unit generators in another video. So in summary, we've seen that sound synthesis is when you make sound signals by putting together or connecting synthesis devices, which we're going to call unit generators. Sound synthesis can be done with electrical devices, as in the case of so-called analog synthesis, but it can also be done with software, software synthesis, and the advantages of that include portability, low cost, and scalability. 
and then we looked at some of the many applications of sound synthesis. See you soon.